All right, good morning all. Um, <clears throat> today we're gonna keep it going with our potatoes, grains, and pasta. So today what we're gonna cover is we're gonna finish potatoes. There was a video I found just going over recipes so you guys can see what some, some different dishes are um, for the potatoes. So let's go ahead and get started with this. It's kind of a long video, but it's pretty good. And it kind of, it goes all the way through where the food's from and then how they cook it. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start with this. Uh, poo. Now let me get down to it. <clears throat> and then we'll be done with potatoes. So we're gonna, today we're gonna start talking about legumes. So you guys can see what I mean when I talk legumes. Um, where's it at? Okay, we went through fries. Okay, this is it. So let me start this and then um, we'll continue on with uh, some questions about this and your um, your homework. And then also I'm gonna start the page just to show you what the different types of legumes are and then we'll continue on with those with day two. All right, here we go. For this dish, I'm using a yellow. Let's start, sorry. I had no idea that something this good could exist in the world. I love potatoes. This is such a fun episode. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beryl. And the theme of this week's episode is brrr, potatoes. <laughs> this is a theme that so, so many of you asked for and here I am delivering. In this one, I have chosen five different preparations that I thought were, first of all, very potato forward and made me think a little bit differently about just what a potato can do. <coughs> Sorry. And with that, let the potato episode begin. <laughs> These are pounded potatoes from Yunnan province in China. For this, I'm using red bliss potatoes. These potatoes have red skin and are cream colored on the inside, and they're very waxy, which means that they have a low starch content and they're gonna hold their shape well after cooking. Traditionally, this dish uses a Yunnan potato, but I couldn't get one here, so this is my substitute. China is actually the world's biggest potato producer. Farming of this tuber can be found in every single region of the country. The majority, however, are grown in the northern mountainous regions of China. Yunnan province, where this dish is from, is actually in the southwest of the country. It's a Han dish that uses a mortar and pestle to pound the potatoes until they stretch. The recipe doesn't use any butter or additional fats. The creaminess comes from the waxiness of the potatoes. It's a dish that is typical of home cooking and surprisingly, not so difficult to recreate. I cannot believe that this worked. I mean, you saw. Those potatoes got stretchy. This is wild! Whoa. So this is a potato dish from Yunnan province in China. And really what it's doing is working with the waxiness of the potatoes to make them kind of mochi-like. It is not like a mashed potato because it's like, it's almost dough-like in my mouth. There's a lot of texture happening here. Huh. It's, it's, I'm struggling a little bit because I've never had anything like this. It's, I like it. Okay, this is definitely mashed potato adjacent, but if you were to serve this to me and say, hey, I made you mashed potatoes and I ate it, I would be like, what did you just serve me? I can see how maybe some people might not love this immediately because there is this expectation that this is kind of like a mashed potato, but it's not. So if you go into it expecting that, I think that you would really like it. Yeah. This next dish is called Causariena and it's from Peru. If you didn't know, the potato is actually from Peru. Over 7,000 years ago, historians believed that the Incas cultivated potatoes on the shores of Lake Titicaca all the way up in the Andes mountain range. Since then, the potato has remained an important part of not only Peruvian culture, but the cuisine as well. There are over 4,000 types of native potatoes grown in the highlands of Peru. 
While the potato has been improved for thousands of years, it didn't make its way out of the country until Spanish conquistadors invaded Peru in the 1500s looking for gold. Instead, they found the potato. As for the dish itself, rellena means stuffed, but causa has its own story. The dish in its modern form seems to have been created during the Pacific War in 1879, where Peru and Bolivia fought Chile. Supplies were in demand and Peruvian women went door to door taking food donations telling people it was for the cause. They concocted this sandwich-like dish using the donated ingredients like potatoes, carrots, and onion. Today, the dish is served as a starter and something that you share with friends and obviously use to impress them because it looks so beautiful. I was very nervous when I was lifting that can up, but zaza, it's so pretty. <laughs> this is a Casa Riena from Peru and I'm impressed with myself. Yum. It's interesting because this definitely has the vibes of a tuna sandwich, but it's not because it's mashed potatoes instead of bread. The thing was for this, I could not actually find all of the ingredients, especially the pepper. So in order to get the yellow color, I used turmeric. You know, is this then the most authentic version of causa? No, it's not. But all of us are not gonna be able to find all of the ingredients to make these dishes the most authentic way. So if there are workarounds, you know, I might be wrong in saying this, but I think it's okay because, I mean, this tastes amazing. And um, that's what I could do. <laughs> the potatoes are so creamy and smooth and the lime juice in it is a really interesting. I never put lime juice in mashed potatoes. So there's like a really nice zing to them. I made mine with tuna because that's what I had in my house, but also traditionally this is made with chicken, but I did check and tuna was okay. <laughs> this is definitely a potato forward dish. The mashed potatoes are the star. Sorry, tuna salad. <laughs> this is kind of definitely a dish that I think impresses people if you serve it to them. I'm impressed and I'm serving it to myself, so. <laughs> this is called kampir and it comes from Turkey. For this dish, I'm using a yellow creamer potato. These are small in size and waxy, which makes them really good for roasting. This is a popular street food in Istanbul, but it can be found in other parts of Turkey as well. Interestingly, potatoes arrived in Turkey by way of Croatia, which may be where the dish got its name, because the Croatian word for potato is krumpir. This is definitely the simplest recipe of the bunch, as krumpir is basically a loaded baked potato. I chose it, however, because of what it is loaded with. Where a jacket or baked potato might have butter, sour cream, beans, and cheese, the Turks take it up a notch. They load this dish with sausage, all sorts of pickled vegetables, cheese, and what you end up with is a savory and tangy hot roasted potato with flavors that give your mouth a wake up call. Okay, so this is Turkish kumpir, which is pretty much the best looking baked potato I have ever seen. Mm. I really liked this because it made me think differently about what a baked potato could be. Yum. Adding all the different pickled sides is so good and something that I have actually never done. I recently just went to the Polish grocery store and bought a ton of pickled vegetables. So this was a pretty ideal dish for me to make because I had everything at home. Oh my God. So this is a very typical street food in Istanbul. And I think it's really interesting to think about a baked potato loaded up like this as street food. I don't really know how you would eat it on the street. Wow, I'm gonna eat this whole potato. In relation to some of the other potato dishes that I've done, this one might seem a little bit basic, but I think that this is a really great example of using another culture's technique to spice up something that you might do normally. I don't know, make it honestly 10 times better. <laughs> this potato dish is called Goguma Matang, and it comes from South Korea. 
I'm using a Korean sweet potato for this dish. It has a brownish purple skin and is kind of yellow on the inside, and they're kind of oblong in shape. Koguma means sweet potato in Korean, and matang is a caramelization process. So these are candied sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes first arrived in Japan via the Portuguese in the 1600s, and they then went from Japan to Korea in the 1700s, where they have become a winter food staple, where you'll often find them roasted over an open fire. In general, Korean sweet potatoes are much sweeter than North American varieties, which is why candying them works actually really, really well. So this is a dessert. It's a candied sweet potato. It's from Korea called Goguma Matang. And I'm not gonna lie, I messed this up like three times. This is the best version of what it's supposed to be. Use my fingers. I mean, it's good. <laughs> oh. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I haven't really cooked many sweet things. I am not a baker. I'm not really good with measurements and really taking my time. I like cooking because you can kind of keep fixing things as you mess up. When you're making a candy coating, a lot of things can go wrong and they all went wrong for me. I burned the sugar. At the end, I do think I got close to it because there's a really nice sheen. You can kind of hear this. That's like the crispiness on the outside. I've never thought about a potato as a dessert, even with sweet potatoes. But this is really fun. Soft on the inside, crunchy on the outside. It is like popping candy though. Hmm. Okay, yeah. I mean, I guess I, well, I can show that I did kind of do it right because they're all stuck together from the sugar coating. Okay. Mm. Yum. This is really good. Next one. The final dish is ube halaya from the Philippines. For this, I am using an ube potato, also known as a sweet purple yam. The potatoes are bright purple in color, both outside and inside, and a bit longer and thinner in shape. Ube is actually native to the Philippines and a staple in the country's most famous dessert, halo halo. The potato itself is sweet, not as sweet as an orange jam, but it also has this nutty and vanilla-like flavor, which is why it lends itself perfectly to desserts over savory dishes. You'll find that it's commonly used in the Philippines in cakes, flan, ice cream, cookies, and so much more. This ube halaya is a sort of sweet jam that can be eaten on its own or acts as the base for all of the other dishes I mentioned above. And oh my gosh, this purple color is so beautiful. I'm ending on a sweet note with ube halaya from the Philippines. And I'm, <laughs> I've tasted this already. It's really, really good. I haven't tasted it on bread though. Oh my God. I feel all of the years of my life wasted, having never had this until right now. <laughs> it's potatoey. So don't think that all the other ingredients make the potatoiness go away, because it doesn't. Obviously the condensed milk and evaporated milk, the sweetness comes through. It is not overpoweringly sweet, but gives me everything that I crave if I am craving sweets. Also, the color, I, it's absolutely gorgeous. There's no food coloring. This is just the natural color of the purple potato. I topped it with toasted coconut. It's nice. So I found this ube potato at the Asian grocery store in Chinatown here in New York City. If you don't have access to something like that, you can also buy this grated and frozen. So maybe online, maybe like a Whole Foods or a more kind of specialty type of grocery store in the US. My mouth is so happy. It's easy to think about all potatoes being the same because I'm sorry, potato, but like you're not the sexiest vegetable out there. You're just a potato. 
definitely something that I have learned about this is that potatoes are so versatile. Like potatoes can do anything. And I barely scratched the surface of what potatoes are capable of. I mean, I didn't even do French fries. I think that a French fry episode could be really interesting because I imagine that people put different- Okay, <clears throat> so yes, the French fry episode would be interesting. Um, I want to show you guys that video just because, well, her face right here is kind of funny, but, um, but um, sorry, I digress. But with the video, you can kind of see that one, um, the potato started in Peru. You know, that was a big thing. And that's one thing you'll learn if you go to culinary schools, they go over that constantly. But potatoes have spread all over the globe. And um, especially like Northern hemisphere where there's not a lot of growing season. So like your Irish potatoes, you know, uh, Russia, places like that where you have long cold seasons, potatoes thrive because they grow underground. And you'll see that a lot of dishes that are made in these colder climates have potatoes in them, potatoes, radish, kale, stuff that can withstand the harsh climates. And what they do with them, it's not just like baked potatoes. I mean, they use potatoes for everything. Potatoes can be a thickener. Um, they can be the main dish. They can be an additive. They can be shredded, baked, fried, boiled, um, pureed, I mean, mashed, anything, and then added to other things. Like that first, that one dish you showed, it was almost like this, this sandwich of the bread. They actually use bread and in, in, in bread, or I'm sorry, they use potatoes in bread making. So potato starch. So you'll find potato loaf at the grocery store. It's a common uh, bread. Um, but there's so many things. It's the, probably one of the most versatile ingredients you could have because it's a good filler. They're cheap. Um, they are cheap mainly because you know, take like an apple that grows on a tree, you have to worry about seasons, you have to worry about the weather above ground, you have to worry about bugs, you have to worry about um, animals eating them. Potatoes grow underground. Uh, you, they're not really affected by, like if there's a thunderstorm, it's not gonna blow over your potatoes. Um, they're underground. So you gotta think of it that way, is it's like the safest thing to grow because it's under the earth, okay? Um, and they have an extremely long shelf life, like a potato from harvest to processing to eating is a long time, whereas most vegetables have a very short, the second it's picked, you, you have a timeline of when that's going to go bad. So take a tomato, the tomato goes from green to red on the vine, um, you have a few days before that thing starts to go bad. Um, but a potato, you know, if it's stored properly, potatoes last a long time, not forever, but a lot longer than most vegetables and fruits. Um, so th that's where I wanted to go with this. I want you guys to see that because I think there's so many things with potatoes. I didn't scratch the surface either. Um, there's just, it's just so much in there. <clears throat> so that's potatoes. Um, now we're gonna move on to legumes and grains. So we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about what legumes are right now. Um, and then tomorrow or day two, we're gonna go over a lot of dishes with these. So legumes are seeds from pod producing plants. Um, they're often stored and sold in dried form, so they last longer rather than fresh. Um, and especially no matter what country you're in, what region, a lot of places still don't have refrigeration. So dried beans and legumes are the best way to go because you have a longer shelf life. You know, cook as you need, um, soak them when you need them, that kind of thing. Good source of carbohydrates and fiber. So as far as like how that goes, if you imagine taking a, like a black bean, okay? When you're looking at it, just for a, a mental thought, you have the outer shell, okay, of the black bean. That is your fiber. You squeeze it and you see the pulp inside that's soft and mushy. That is your carbs, okay? Um, together, they're a powerhouse. Like it's really good for you. Um, it, it provides types of proteins, uh, not a complete protein, but incomplete. So it means you have to have, pair it with something else, another incomplete protein to make a full protein. Um, but it's got a lot of carbohydrates. So it has a lot of uh, <clears throat> calories to it. So the way that works is everything's measured by calories, which means basically how much energy is needed to use that, to burn it. 
like a kilocalorie. So <clears throat> the lower the calorie, um, the less energy, okay? So if you have something with high calories or if you have something like take a bean, um, that it produces a lot of energy for you because of the amount of carbohydrates in it. I might be you know, getting off subject, but anywho. All right, so the four categories of legumes, you have beans, peas, nuts, and seeds, okay? So this chart over here <clears throat> is your beans and peas. So you've probably heard of these. Um, chickpeas right here, also known as garbanzo beans. Um, quinoa, which is an ancient grain, high in protein. Lentils, cannellini beans, um, which is uh, like an Italian kidney bean. And by kidney beans, see how these are shaped? They're literally, if you look at a human kidney, that's why they're called kidney beans because they have the same shape as a human kidney. And these ones, the, these kidney beans, um, actually look like a color of a kidney. So um, that's why they, they say that shape. Um, lentils, there's different, you know, different types of lentils, mung dal, French beans, black-eyed peas, <clears throat> soybeans, uh, pinto, mung beans, green lentils, split peas, black beans. Um, and a lot of these are very uh, region specific, you know, like black eyed peas are very Southern. I'm not sure where they originated from, but I wanna say Africa maybe, because a lot of them ended up over here, um, you know, through slave trades and such. And then People basically the re the reason play, you know places now have these different things is if people move to different countries they would bring things um, or if they were forced to go to another country they would bring things with them uh, that they knew how to cook you know what I mean and if these are dried a lot of people know how to replant stuff like that so they can take these items with them so those are your <clears throat> different types of beans and peas this part over here um, when you get to your nuts and seeds. So as far as peanuts go, those are considered a legume. Those, those grow a little different from other nuts. So you take almonds, um, pistachio, Brazil nuts, macadamias. These things grow on trees. Peanuts grow on a vine on the ground, okay? That's what makes them somewhat different. And then corn nuts, those are just roasted corn. But um, as far as seeds go, probably the most popular that you've had are pumpkin, okay? or not pumpkin, but um, sunflower seeds. If you've ever seen a sunflower plant, it's a giant flower that can grow up to like eight to 10 feet tall. Um, and they have sunflower seeds in them, okay? They also produce oil. So a lot of these are pressed and the, the oils extracted from them, so sunflower oil. And then another one that's pretty common are um, the salted pepitas, which are roasted salted pumpkin seeds. So they're actually, probably one of my favorites because they have, if they're done properly, they have this perfect texture to them. Um, and they're not harvested from pumpkins that are like 25,000 pound, you know, those giant pumpkins people try to grow because those seeds get a little huge and tough and not very good. These are more of like a medium size uh, <clears throat> carving pumpkin size. But um, also they, you know, pumpkin seed oil. A lot of these you can get the oils from here, which have the same flavor. So cashew oil, walnut oil, uh, some of the higher end oils, they don't produce as much oil as like say an olive or where they get like canola oil, which is also called rapeseed oil. You know, those kind of things, a lot of the corn oil, a lot of those different vegetables. So these don't produce as much oil as some of those. That's why they're a little more expensive. So like a quart of walnut oil is gonna be, you know, 25 bucks, 20 bucks, whereas a quart of canola oil is gonna be like $3. Okay, same thing with peanut oil. Those, those, it's kind of in the midway. Um, it's still a high expensive oil um, because it's, you know, where they're extracting it from. And then with these, sorry, going a little tangent, these different oils have different properties. So they have different smoke points. So it's take peanut oil. You can get that over 400 degrees and it won't start to burn yet. That's why it's great for fried chicken, for deep frying. Then you have like a walnut oil, which is a lot lighter and has a very lower, a lot lower smoke point. So you really can't cook with this. This is more of a finishing oil. So if you wanna do like a nice salad dressing or vinaigrette, um, you would use a walnut oil in that. So it has a walnut flavor, but you're not gonna really heat it up. 
Okay. So smoke point is at the point when it's when it smokes. So like you heat something till it starts to smoke, that's the smoke point. And that's when it starts to degrade and burn. And you don't want that. So even like olive oil, you have extra virgin olive oil, which has a very low smoke point. Then you have just plain olive oil, which is like the second run of it that has a higher smoke point. So that's how that works. Um, <clears throat> but we'll get into this part. This will probably be uh, next week. We'll go into nuts and seeds because there's so many different applications for these between desserts um, and then in regular, you know, like culinary needs, you know, like you, I've used walnuts for pork chop dishes. I have crusted things with macadamia nuts and um, cashews. I mean, there's just so many different applications to this. And I want to get into a little bit of allergies too, because there's a lot of nut allergies, especially peanuts and what it can actually do. So from a safety point, we need to go over that as well. Let me make a note. So um, the question today I'm going to put in are going to be over that video. So I'm just going to kind of ask you guys the questions of where did this dish come from? Um, so, you know, make sure you watch the video. <clears throat> and like I said, we'll, we'll keep going with uh, tomorrow or the day two, we're going to cover a lot of bean dishes and why they're very important to different parts of the world because they're very versatile. And a lot of times this is the only protein some countries get is beans and rice. So I did a whole section on that. So that's what I have for you guys today. Uh, we'll uh, pick back up tomorrow. Don't forget your question.